Amen. Praise God. Welcome to Church on the Move. We're so happy to have you here today. You know, isn't it good? I was just listening to that song and I was thinking, isn't it, isn't it good when you know somebody else is in control? When I was a kid, I can remember uh, driving to motorcycle races early in the morning. And all my job was was to get in the van, throw a blanket over me, and just rest. And I could hear the music that was playing on the radio, but I knew my dad had it. I knew he had control of the wheel, I knew he knew where he was going, and I had absolutely no anxiety over it whatsoever. And I'm here to tell you today, your God's in control, amen? Your Father is in control, and we can rest in Him, and that's such an amazing thing to be able to do, no matter the circumstance. Again, welcome to Church on the Move, happy to have you here today. I have a sermon for you today titled, Where is the Pony? And I'm just going to let you think about that for a while and see if you can have any idea where I'm going to go with it. Amen? Where is the pony? And I said to Jonathan this morning, I said, you know, sometimes you just got to ask yourself, where is the pony? And he looked at me like, man, those are good meds you're on, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Amen. Uh, our offering is in the back, in the buckets right there in the back by the doors, as well as we have a drop uh, slot there in the foyer you're welcome to use. Uh, God has continued to bless our church even through thin times uh, that we have as a nation, uh, but he has uh, been so faithful to what he has promised us here at Church on the Move. So if you'd like to give, you can drop it back there. Uh, if you'd like to give to missions, you can do that at any time. It does not have to be the first uh, Sunday of the week. Uh, we kind of got off track with missions uh, when 2020 hit. We have continued to support our missionaries. There has not been a uh, payment missed at all, but uh, just a reminder that if you would like to support our missionaries, you can uh, uh, earmark that on the tithing envelope as well because we want to continue to uh, support those that have went overseas and, and are spreading the gospel in areas that are, are oh so difficult. I'm going to have uh, Jonathan come up for our announcements. Uh, one quick one I have before he gets started. Uh, Sonia, I talked with her uh, earlier this week. As you, many of you know, her husband, John uh, Long, passed away this summer. And uh, it, it was going to be <coughs> cremated, and uh, they were going to have a burial service back in California, I believe, but that did not work out. So we're going to be doing a, graveyard, or a graveside service at 11 a.m. this Saturday, the 16th. This be a short service uh, for Sonia as, as she uh, puts John to rest. And uh, I had many, many opportunities to talk with John uh, in his time here at the church. And he was a great guy. So uh, we're going to honor him and do that service. So if you'd like to attend, that's 11 a.m. Saturday, the 16th uh, at, the, at the cemetery. Well, good morning, Church on the Move. It's an exciting day to be here, just like every Sunday, really. But I'm excited to find out where the pony is. <laughs> so I have a couple announcements for you. We're going to get through them real quick. And the first is uh, Glow Night. That's, or, yeah, Glow Night. It's uh, right around the corner. It's going to be here before we know it, like really. like I mean, can you believe that we're already in October? Like that's insane to me. Like Hannah said that the other day. She's like, we're almost done with like our first block of schooling and like that's just wild to me because we were just in summer. Like I was just complaining about how hot it was. <laughs> yeah, we're, s <laughs> that's true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you didn't even stop to think about it. <laughs> it's impressive. Well, uh, uh, Glow Night is October 31st. That's going to be 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. right out here in front of the church. Uh, pastors Matt and Naomi, they've put a lot into this, and so they are asking for a little bit of help. They've put a bin out in the lobby uh, where they're just asking for, like, candy donations is their primary thing. Uh, I believe that that bin will be out there until the event happens. So if you'd like to help out, feel free to throw some candy in there. They're planning to have about 250 kids. So basically, we we cannot have enough candy. <laughs> so uh, if you'd like to help us out with that, uh, if you'd like to help out in any other way, you can track down either Pastor Matt or Pastor Naomi after Kids Church. Um, they have their hands full right now, trust me. <laughs> but uh, no, I'm really excited for that event. We'll be there. Feel free to come hang out with us. There will be uh, coffee, hot dogs, hot chocolate, candy. So if you want to come hang out with us, please do that. 
we will be much closer to Christmas. Right, Lemon? Yeah. <laughs> uh, the next is October, which started October 1st through November 30th. We will have the opportunity to raise some funds for our community food bank. We have some people who work really, really hard next door, and they do a lot to make sure that people in our community get food when they can't necessarily afford it. Um, so now is our opportunity where not only our donations go to the food bank, but Town Pump is also matching all donations up to seven hundred or uh, sorry, seven thousand five hundred dollars. So that could go a really long way to feeding people that just can't afford it. So yes, I'm going to say that one more time because I messed it up. They are matching all donations up to seven thousand dollars, seven thousand five hundred dollars. <laughs> Numbers aren't my thing. <laughs> just wait till I get to the PO box. <laughs> <laughs> donations can be dropped off at the food bank itself at town pump or they can be sent to p.o box 767 <laughs> so feel free if you'd like to donate uh you can take it to the food bank town pump or send it into the p.o box uh either is good and they are matching that so that's till november 30th and this is a really really cool opportunity to get a little bit ahead with our food bank. So uh, feel free to drop off a donation. So Matthew 5.14 says, you are the light of the world. So I was thinking about that, and I was like, what, what exactly does that mean? What it means is that because the presence of God dwells in us, we are called to be the shining example of who he is. We live in a fallen world, which means that it becomes a darker and darker place all the time. Imagine being somebody who has never seen the light before. Some things that happen in our lives, like the really hard stuff that comes up, we are able to rely on God. Not everybody can fall back on that. If you lay it out, it's pretty simple. When people find themselves in darkness, they seek light. It doesn't matter how faint or small that light is. As long as it's there, there is hope. We are called to be that light. Therefore, making us the hope that some people are out there looking for. And the cool thing about light in dark places is that you can see even the tiniest ray from a distance. So maybe that'll be somebody in line behind you who sees the way that you treat the cashier. Or maybe it's the person at a table across from you at a restaurant who sees you tip way more than you needed to. Don't take that for granted. And don't think that it's just Pastor Chuck that needs to be the light, because it's all of us. For, for those who are living in the dark, and sometimes even for those who live in the light. It's on us to carry the hope of Jesus with us on display for everyone who needs it. So now I am going to ask Sid to come out. She has something that she would like to discuss. <laughs> Give it up for Sid. Woo! morning. So it is October, which means it's pastor and staff appreciation again. So I get elected as the only female on the board to take care of this little detail because that's what we women do. So I just wanted to bring it to our attention again that we need to show appreciation to our pastors and staff, not only in October, but all year round, consistently. They do hard jobs that they are called to do that may not necessarily be fun or even fulfilling at times. And just like everybody, they need words of encouragement and appreciation. So you should have gotten a, a little brochure like this when you came in. If you didn't, please pick one up. Um, it's from a website called blessyourpastor.org, and it's got 50 ideas, 50 creative ways to bless your pastor and staff. And please prayerfully look through these and take to heart whatever the Spirit leads you to do for your pastors and staff. Um, we need to make sure that we show our deep appreciation for those who cherish you and diligently work as ministers among you. And our board tries diligently to make sure that our pastors and staff are not only compensated financially, but also they're appreciated in other ways. And as a congregation, 
in our community, we need to all come alongside for that. So some things to point out um, that I wanted to point out in particular is that we need to faithfully and regularly pray for our pastors and staff. Hold them up in prayer. They need covering and protection because they're in a spiritual battle for you and they need extra from us. We need to let them know how God is specifically using them to bless us. Tell them what has happened, what that, that, that you know is a direct result of the pastor's sermon or somebody's outreach, or some, you know that the intercessors prayed for your need and you saw an answer, and you need to give a testimony on that. Give God the glory. We need to give our pastors, staff, and their spouses the freedom to be who they are. It's not our job to crit critique or judge them. We need to pray for them and their families. And if you feel like you have something that needs to be said about them or to them about their family, pray about it. I encourage you to go home and pray for a week. And if you feel like the Holy Spirit still wants you to say something, then you're free to say something to them in private. Use your talents and skills and possessions to bless our pastors and staff. Share with them meals, gift cards. Invite them to go with you on events. Take them, give them concert, give them concert tickets, um, ball game tickets. Um, share them, share with them what you can do. If you can babysit, if you can fix their car, if you can roof their house, if you can clean their house, if you can mow their lawn, any service is greatly appreciated. And obviously, we need to faithfully give financially. We're called to support our churches financially, and please pray for the Spirit to guide you in how much you give. I want to make sure that we all know we've had changes in our staff and pastors over the last couple of years. We have our senior pastor, Pastor Chuck Standiford, and his wife, Krista. We have our children's pastors, Matt and Naomi Hitchcock. We have our youth man pastors, Jonathan and Hannah Ziegler. And then we have our staff that includes Eric and Cheryl Davis. Eric has been our worship leader now for a little bit. Cheryl works in our office and also is the administrator of the food bank. We also have other staff, administrators and janitorial staff. We have Jessica Peterson, Chris Allen, and Judy Sikich. They serve you every week, day by day. We also have many volunteers that work tirelessly in all areas of our church's ministry to, work, to serve us and our community. So I just wanted to bring that to our attention. Please add everybody to your prayer list and don't let it just be for October. It needs to be all year round. Thanks. What a great word, Sid. That was so good. <laughs> Amen. You know, I want to let you know that this, this church is a special place. It always has been. Uh, and it's always been full of special people. And uh, as, as churches go with the pastors that I talk to and the, and the troubles that some of them encounter and some of the things that they have to uh, overcome are many of the things that I simply don't see here, I don't find here. And I think that's because we are a body that is truly trying to press into who God is and what he has for us. And I would encourage you, the people that, uh, you're Matt, Naomi, Jonathan, Hannah, um, you know, Jessica Peterson, Eric and Cheryl, these people that uh, have taken on a, a big role within the church to help move it forward for the kingdom. And sometimes we have the finances to help support, and sometimes we have to, to tailor back yet, and God has not opened some of the doors yet. So know that they are working for little many times. 
but they are so invested in the kingdom and what's going to happen and so excited about the, the vision that God has given that they show up and do things that they're simply not paid to do. But they just show up and do them because they love you and, and they love God. And I'm so blessed with uh, an amazing staff and, and people that have went unnamed that just show up and, and just get things done. Amen? So uh, very thankful for, uh, for all of our staff and our board members and, and everyone who, who gives so much. Now, as we enter into worship here, um, like I told you, sermon title is Where is the Pony? And as I begin to look at this and begin to think about it as I was, as I was preparing this sermon, there, there comes a time where we've got to know what we're looking for. We've got to know what we're looking for. But we have to do it with an attitude that says we enjoy being a redeemed child of God. Amen? Because people can see right through it. You can trudge through and you can... You can make deadlines and you can, you can serve a church, but if you're not doing it with the right attitude, people see straight through it, and it's for naught. And the things that are coming up, we talked about the food bank and, and, the, and the, the fun drive that's happening and the individuals that are working in the food bank. The Lord showed me, when I, before I took this church, he showed me as I was walking from the post office and I had all of these people behind me that I didn't know. I didn't recognize, but they were following me. And I looked over to the side, and here came all of these people that are, are ones that some are still here and some have passed and went on to be with Jesus, but it was the, the foundation or the, the people that laid the groundwork for this church, and they were coming the other way up from the mangy moose there. And I thought, how are we both going to, to be able to get to the church because we're going to meet each other at the same time? And as we approached the intersection, we just flawlessly merged together, and I looked up, and there was our church. And it was amazing, and it was glorious, and it was different than it looks now. And there was so much love and hope and joy pouring out from it. And 2020 happened, we saw the food bank and the clothing bank and the soup kitchen begin to have so many people pressing in on it that we didn't have enough room. And now we've been, we're looking at the vision that God gave that we needed to build and expand because there's going to come a time where we are going to be the place that is going to be able to serve people and show them the love of Jesus in extreme times. And when I had this vision and when I had this dream, I thought, what does that look like exactly? Well, when 2020 hit, it became very obvious that if we can get that worked up about toilet paper then what happens when something real comes along? Something that's substantial, something that makes something like the COVID outbreak look small, that can happen. And this church is going to be prepared to show people who Jesus is. And some things have been taking place behind the scenes that I can't comment on yet because I need to make sure it's 100% done. But I can't wait to tell you about some of the ways God has been moving. We're going to see expansion. We're going to see new buildings. We're going to see new services. And we're going to see a facility that is capable of handling 10, 20, 30 times what we saw during 2020. You say, well, you're awful excited for tragedy to come knocking. <laughs> if that's what it takes for more to know who Jesus is, then bring it. Whatever it is. I'm excited. I'm excited, but we have got to be in the right frame of mind, and we have to be willing, and we have got to be looking for where the pony is. We've got to be looking. So let's worship our king today. Let's worship him and lift him high for everything that he's done for you, for your family. Think back on those things, those, those prayers that have been answered, that you forgot about his answer. You forgot about what he did for you or what he brought you out of. Remember what he has done. Let's focus on him today and give him the honor that he deserves.
Thank you, Jesus. Heavenly Father, we praise and glorify your name today. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. You guys go back around and play Amazing Grace. Something's laid upon my heart this morning. This happens sometimes. I feel like there are people in this building. God gave me a particular phrase. If you are in this place and you feel like your back is against the wall, if you're in this place and your situation says your back is against the wall, you don't know which way to turn, you feel like you're hemmed in, you feel like you can't go forward, you can't go left, you can't go right, you are just backed up against the wall. If that is you this morning, your back is against the wall, you've prayed for relief from whatever your circumstance is, you've, you've cried out to God and nothing seems to be taking place and you just feel aggravated and you feel discouraged every day. Your back is just against the wall. That just keeps coming back to me. Your back is against the wall. If that's you this morning, find your way to the front of this church. Find your way to the front of this church because our God is bigger than your situation. Our God is bigger. Thank you, Jesus. As they play this song, Amazing Grace, if you feel you need to come up to the front because your back is against the wall, please do it now. Don't feel like next week maybe it's going to get better or maybe you'll have a breakthrough by doing the same things over and over. If your back's against the wall, get up front. But if you don't, I want you to sing this with our worship team. I want you to lift your hands and your voices to the heavens because His grace is amazing.
Thank you, Jesus. Praise and honor you in this place today. Father, I ask that as always, the words that come out of my mouth be yours, not mine. The tone it be set in be yours, not mine. You're in total control, Father. This is your word and we are your people. Father, we ask that it would settle upon our heart, that we would hear it, that we would hold it up against the standard that is your word. And Father, that we would grow in you, Father, that your kingdom, that your kingdom would grow. And Father God, it's all about you. We just ask your presence be in this place with us, Father, that, this, that the words would be heard. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. God is so good, isn't he? And he knows what we need. He knows where we're at. And I say this often. If you're here today, you were meant to be here today. You were meant to hear the word that God has given me. And, and you've heard me say it before. Oftentimes, the word that God has given me is not what I want to preach. It's not what I want to talk about. Often because it has a sting for me personally. Amen. Amen. But I'm always, no matter what, going to deliver the truth that God has asked me to deliver. Because he simply just knows a lot of things I don't. So that brings us to this sermon, Where is the Pony? Where is the Pony? In order to, get, in order to better understand people's views of the world, a researcher placed two children, one a pessimist and the other an optimist, alone in separate rooms. The pessimist was placed in a colorful room full of all kids and imaginative toys. The optimist was put in a room filled with horse manure. The first child played in the room for a little while, but soon came to the door asking to leave because the toys were boring and because they broke too easily. Likewise, the young optimist soon came to the door, but rather than asking to leave, she asked for a shovel. Of course, the researcher asked the child why she wanted a shovel. She replied, with all this manure around, I know that there must be a pony in here somewhere. <laughs> what a great outlook, amen? Has anybody here ever been in a room in their life that's been full of manure? I don't know how many times I actually asked for a shovel. So the question I'm asking today is, are we getting tired of our toys? Are we looking for that pony? Which one is it? Because oftentimes we can treat church much like that room that's full of toys. It's, we come to a place that uh, heat is provided for us. We have chairs. We have coffee. We have all the things that we need to enjoy our service. And we, we play with our spiritual toys and and we have a lot of fun with it, but then sometimes there, there comes a point where you get bored. And you're bored of the church, and you're bored of what you're hearing, and you're bored of, of the spiritual things. And, and so you knock on the door because you're just kind of done. You get pessimistic about it, and you're done, and you, and you want out. What would it look like if the church was full of people who, no matter what the situation is, whether it was a clean room with straw and everything you needed, or whether it was full of manure, you had an optimistic outlook that I'm going to make the best of this situation. That I'm going to ask for a shovel so I can start digging because I know there must be a pony in here. It's the kind of attitude we've got to get a hold of. Because optimistic people are looking for purpose. We often spend our time trying to find what our individual purpose is. What has God created me to do? Who has God created me to be? Is it to be a pastor? Is it to be an evangelist? Is it to be on the worship team? Is it to all these different things that run through our head? And I've talked with so many people that are trying to find out, what is it? What is, what is my purpose? We all share in a purpose. Our value is not based on the ranking of importance that man gives a position or a calling. Our value is found in him. 2 Timothy 1.9, 
who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. The phrase holy calling literally means a holy invitation, meaning that God has called, has called out to us a holy invitation. An invitation to live, an invitation to thrive, an invitation to be part of his purpose. He's given all of us an invitation to be part of the body of Christ, amen? We get caught up in what part are we going to play within it? Is, it. is it a part that is esteemed enough for me? Is it a part that's going to give me enough attention? Is it a part that allows me to have a microphone or not? What, what part am I going to play in the kingdom? Because if it's not the right part, I don't want it. But the part is being part of the body of Christ. But we become fickle and, and we, we want to change things within the structure of our life because if we can just change a few things, maybe that changes our destiny or our purpose. According to the National Center for Education Stats, about 80% of students in the United States end up changing their major at least once. And on average, college students change their major at least three times over the course of their college career. Why? Because they are afraid they're going to miss their purpose. Well, I think I'm a doctor. So they start off in school. Well, that ain't going to work. I feel, I feel called now to this other profession. So now I think I'm going to be a lawyer. And as the debt racks up and as all these things begin to mount on their lives and they are changing their major and keep taking course and pretty soon that four-year college turns into a nine-year experience, leaving them with amazing amounts of debt, they're confused. People are afraid they're going to miss their purpose. And I can understand it because if you're, if you're a young person going into college, going into a program, whatever you've chosen to do. You're desperate to find your purpose and to lock in because guess what? Life moves really fast. I'm still trying to figure out what I really want to do with my life. Amen? Aren't we all to an extent? I was the worst when it came to picking something I wanted to do because I know I knew that God had called me to ministry, so therefore I wanted to find every other possible thing I could do than that. We're afraid to miss our purpose. We become confused without the Lord as our guide. If he is our guide and we are listening to what he has called for our life, there is no mistaking it. There is no questioning it. If we let him open the doors, if we let him guide us step by step, we don't have to be confused anymore. But so many have no idea what that means to be purposed with him. Ephesians 3.11, according to the eternal purpose which he pur purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. The key words to note here in this verse are purpose, purposed, and in Christ. The word purpose means the setting forth of a thing. And the word purposed means carried into effect. All things are set forth in Christ. All the purpose and plan of God is seen and revealed in Christ. We cannot separate ourselves from the purpose in Christ. What is true concerning him is true concerning us as we are in Christ. Are you grasping this? Your purpose and my purpose is Christ. Don't let the enemy cause you to look in the wrong place for your purpose. Our purpose is found in him, end of story. What he chooses to do with that, I don't know. It's an amazing journey that I have been on. Since I accepted Jesus into my heart, since I told him, you are the Lord of my life, go ahead, do what you will. It has been an amazing ride. I've tried to get off of it. I've tried to deny it. There's been times I've, I've sat in prayer and, and thought to myself, what did I do? I shouldn't have told him he could have everything. 
I shouldn't have ever indicated to him that I wanted a double portion. I asked for it, and I got it, and I didn't like it. But the enemy will cause you to look in the wrong place for your purpose. The enemy drives people out of churches every single day because they feel like they're being overlooked, like they're not fulfilling what God has, has called them to do in their life. But the, the silly part is 99% of them never asked God. They never inquired with God as to what their purpose was. They never asked him to place them where they needed to be to grow because that's dangerous when you begin to ask God to take control. Because you'll end up, trust me, you will end up where you think you don't belong. So when we jump around and go where we think we belong, we're just delaying the process here. God wants you to grow. He wants to move you. I've sat in this church so many times just glossing over what message was being preached up here. Just getting through the day, just getting through the process. Oh, they need a PowerPoint. They need this or that. I'll take care of that up there. But then I'm just kind of sitting, just letting it gloss over because I'm just on my own little journey here. The things I missed in growth, I can't even count. The times I missed that would have furthered along the process, would have quickened it, I can't even count. We overlook it. Because the enemy will always cause you to look in the wrong place for your purpose. Well, my purpose is found in motorcycle racing. My purpose is found in golf. My purpose is found in banking. My purpose is found in this and that. And you know where that leads? Eventually, it's your purpose is found in a different relationship. Your purpose is found in a different marriage. Your purpose is found in a different geographical location so that you can leave everything behind you. It's always going to follow you. You're always going to know the truth. Don't let the enemy cause you to look in the wrong place. So you might think, well, this sounds easy. We, we just link up to Christ. It's kind of like a Tesla, right? We just link up to, to Christ, and the driving is done for us. We just sit back, and God's got the steering wheel, and here we go. This is all going to be great. Not exactly. And why is that? Because there's something called free will that gets in the way. We control our future choices. Now, this is becoming a hot topic lately. We're having kind of a resurgence of all sorts of different points of views when it comes to how much control we have and how much control God has. Because if you can lay it out that everything is determined, if you can lay it out that there's really nothing you can do about what God is going to do anyway. Well, that seems like a really nice, easy excuse, doesn't it? Well, there's nothing I can really do anyway, so I'm just going to get NFL Sunday ticket and enjoy my life. I mean, I'm going to eat seven hamburgers a day because, I mean, when it's your time, it's your time. Some of the most ridiculous things I have ever dealt with as a minister just drives me crazy. We control our future choices. God gave us free will, and in doing so, gave us a level of control. Well, no, no, Pastor. God will decide when I die. Therefore, I'm going to live how I want to live. That's a selfish and foolish view. God is omniscient. He knows all. Therefore, he knows when your last breath will be. He understands when you're going to die and when you're going to leave this earth. But how you get to it is on you. Well, I just trust God so much. When it's my time, it's my time. I don't need a parachute to go skydiving. I'm just going to, I'm just, when's the last time you heard somebody say that? I'm just going to jump out of this plane and just, and just sit in the glory of God. And an army of angels is going to come and grab me and lower me to earth. I remember all those stories, don't you? No, because if anybody did it, they're not here to tell you about it. Or, I'm just going to wrestle alligators. 
It seems like a fun thing. I want to go to Florida and wrestle alligators on my vacation because God's got this. If tomorrow's my day, it's my day. Or maybe it's, I'm just going to go race motorcycles. I'm going to go do motocross and supercross, and, and God's in charge of all that. Uh, you know, if I meet my end, I meet my end. I used to think this way because I heard it in church this way. I used to hear people say this all the time. But you know what? Everybody that had a horrible diet and could never control their weight, their time seemed to be a little sooner than the other person. The person eating oatmeal seemed to live longer. I wonder why that is. Was it holy oatmeal? It's ridiculous, isn't it? But I hear it all the time. I've heard it all my life. One of the definitions of this type of thinking, now there, this can go a long ways. You can study this out. There are many types. I'm just going to touch briefly on one. And I challenge you to begin to look at these things. One of them we're seeing a resurgence in is determinism. A theistic determinist believes that everything must be determined by God in order for him to remain sovereign. On many levels, this type of determinism has a ring of truth in it. But it fails to recognize that an all-knowing sovereign God could in his wisdom and power determine that man has the capacity for choice and self-determination. One of the commentaries I looked at, author named Geisler, states, it is true that everything God knows must occur according to his will. If it did not, then God would be wrong in what he knew. For an omniscient mind cannot be wrong in what it knows. However, it does not follow from this that all events are determined. God could simply determine that we be self-determining beings in a moral sense. Several problems exist in the human experience if determinism is applied. And determinism is just a gateway to many other things. And many other beliefs that I can't really get into right now. But problems exist in the human experience if it's applied. First, determinism is self-defeating. The determinist must believe that a person's belief or non-belief is already determined, right? If this is the case, then why would a determinist try to convince someone that his view is the right one and the other one should change? That makes no sense at ever because the implication is that the non-determinist should change his view because it implies that there is a choice to be made. Well, you have to change your mind. You need to understand what determinism is true. Well, I thought it was already determined that I don't agree with you. What are you talking about? And so we get this circus-like atmosphere of round and round we go. Was it the chicken or the egg? Do zebras have white stripes, or are they white with black stripes or black with white stripes? We can get into a lot of deep theological discussions, but you need to change your view. Uh, now you're saying there's a choice to be made, but I don't have a choice. See, big words, determinism, Calvinism, a lot of big words, a lot of big studies, a lot of deep scripture, but really, it's not as complicated as you think. And we in future are going to begin some studies on this because I think it's important that we understand exactly who we are and exactly who we are not. Because the enemy will drive wedges and he will cause you to start going down a road that makes no sense whatsoever. And we waste our time because we're not changing our culture. And one of the main things I always tell people, a very simple way that I always approach things when people bring a, a thought or a theology or something to me, is it in God's character? Is it how my God would do things? Because you could come to me and say all sorts of things about what Krista did, but I know exactly who my wife is, completely. Completely. So I will know instantly if this lines up with who she is. 
if you are in the word of God, if you have a prayer life, if you know who God is, then you will know exactly how he will react. Exactly who he is. How he will love people. How he will determine who's in heaven and who is not. Scripture gives us all of that information. But when you know and you know and you know who your God is, that takes care of the wiggle room. Is it in God's character? What follows a pessimist? Anger follows a pessimist. Pessimistic people are no fun to be around. And pessimistic Christians are absolutely the worst. I used to be one. Sometimes I still am. An attitude of pessimism is the very opposite of an attitude of hope and love. I use this scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 4 through 7, all the time at weddings. And every time I am using the scripture, I'm thinking to myself, do they understand what this really means? Or are these just words to fill up the ceremony? Because everything in here, boy, if you're married, you're going to need it. And if you don't apply it, you won't need to worry about it. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. This is very, very powerful scripture. Put your name in this, please. Put your name in there. Chuck is patient and kind. Chuck does not envy or boast. Chuck is not arrogant or rude. Chuck does not insist on his own way. <laughs> Chuck is not irritable or resentful. Chuck does not rejoice at wrongdoing. Chuck rejoices with the truth. Chuck bears all things. Chuck believes all things. Chuck hopes all things. And Chuck endures all things. If you put the scripture on your refrigerator, in your Bible, or somewhere where you can see it, put your name in that place, and it will change the way you view things. Because sometimes I'm not patient and I'm not kind. Sometimes we wander into all of these things. Well, you don't understand my life. My circumstances make me pessimistic. The state of our world drove me to pessimism because I'm just a realist pastor. Here's the thing. We sin because we choose to. Our circumstances don't drive us there, and God certainly does not set us up through them. James chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. See, interestingly enough, people who choose to sin are annoyed by the negative consequences. People who choose to sin are annoyed by the consequences. I've known many a pessimist that doesn't come to church or has decided to leave church or maybe comes once or twice, but they always have that, that face. You remember the bitter beer face commercials? You have those people that have that bitter beer face. Just the mean mug all the time. The temperature's always wrong. The music's always too loud or it's too quiet. If the drums are going, boy, those are loud. They just bother me, Pastor. If we don't have a drummer, hey, Pastor, where were the drums? That bitter beer face type of attitude. But it's the consequences of their sin. Proverbs 19.3, when a man's folly brings his way to ruin, his heart rages against the Lord. 
Somebody has to pay. Somebody has to be responsible for my misery. Your sermon is responsible for my misery. That person not shaking my hand when I clearly was walking by them with my bitter beer face is responsible for my misery. The temperature is responsible for my misery. The politician is responsible for my misery. The gas prices are responsible for my misery. I got news for you. You're responsible for your misery. When a man's folly brings his way to ruin, his heart rages against the Lord because the Lord always ends up in the line of fire, doesn't he? I don't know where you went, God. How could you leave me? You said you never would. Well, if you believe in God and he said he never would, then what are you talking about? When a man foolishly wrecks his life, when a man or a woman foolishly wrecks their life, they may yet insist on blaming God or it's just fate. Maybe you don't blame God, but you put the reflection of your sin on others. This happens every day. When we sin, we don't want to see the true reflection of that sin, so we choose to see someone else's. There's got to be somebody else out there that's worse off than I am. Well, that, that corrupt politician, is just, it's ridiculous what they're doing. It's ridiculous the laws they're trying to pass. It's ridiculous what they're trying to get us to do. This is a smoke screen. A smoke screen that gets thrown out that says, everybody look at them. Everybody look at their problems. Everybody look at their sin. Everybody look at their iniquities. Everybody pay attention to them. And I'm just going to kind of walk through over here with what I got going on. Because God's going to hold them accountable. Be careful. Because he's going to hold you accountable too. We have to stop assuming that if we focus on someone else, that our sin won't have consequences. Isaiah 59.2. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. You say, well, Pastor, that's, that's Old Testament stuff. That's, that's not for today. Well, you're kind of right, because there's some good news. Christ's atoning sacrifice provides the bridge over the separation created by sin. Amen. But sin still separates us from fellowship with God. Because at least at the point of our sin, we no longer think alike with God. I've had this discussion with many people. Well, Christ's atoning sacrifice provided the bridge over the separation created by sin. So I can do literally anything I want to do. And there's nothing Nothing that can bounce me out of the grace that my Savior shows me. If you have that type of attitude, your sin and your attitude will separate you from fellowship with God. So let's say you make it to heaven. Good for you. But what did you do? What was your relationship with Him? Did you love him? Did you honor him? Did you, did you pursue the great commission? What did you do in your relationship with him? Because when you stop having fellowship with God, you're going to have fellowship with somebody. Sin will still separate us from that. As the worship team comes, God opened the door for you to be saved and spend eternity with him. But how you walk through it matters. What we do here matters. Philippians 1, 27 through 28. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. Paul wanted to know that the Philippian church 
is going to stay together as one body without becoming fragmented. He wanted their unity to be put to a productive purpose so that an increasing trust and belief in the good news of Jesus Christ would be promoted among those who already believed and among those who had yet to believe. We're at a time right now, everyone wants to talk about Revelation. Everyone wants to talk about the end times right now. Everyone wants to talk about what's coming as if they know. But I'm telling you, this scripture right here sums it up as to what the church needs to do for what is coming. Because there are going to be some tough times. There are going to be some trials. There, there are going to be things we're going to have to walk through. We know that. That's life. But he lays it out here. I may hear that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. Side by side, firm in one spirit, and with one mind. That's where the church has to get. Our times of coming in and filling a seat and liking or not liking the message and liking and not liking the worship and wondering if we're going to have a potluck and when we're going to do lunch and maybe I'll pick my Bible up if I'm sick. Those days are done. It's got to be over. Culture in this world is shifting and changing faster than I've ever seen it in my life. But the culture of the church needs to get rooted in the truth. Because I'm watching it start to be swept away with the change of the culture of our nation and of our world. We don't get swept away. Our house is built on the rock, not the sand. But if we begin to grab on to bits and pieces of the culture and we begin to act like them and we become pessimistic... It's a, it's a slippery slope, and we don't want to get on it. Our purpose is in Christ. Our future is in Him. In Him, we will not become bored, pessimistic, and frustrated. We will ask for a shovel when things look like a mess because we just know there's a pony in there somewhere. Jesus came and he died for our sins. His blood that was shed upon that cross was the atonement for our sins. He rose from the grave three days later. We have a promise. We have a hope. We can live in joy. We have every reason to be optimistic. This world is only going to drive deeper and deeper into pessimism. So my challenge for you today is no matter where you find yourself, no matter what situation you find yourself in, ask for a shovel because there's something there. Heavenly Father, praise and glorify your name. Father God, I thank you so much for these people that are here today. Father, I thank you so much for this word that you have given us. Father, I ask that it challenge us. I ask that it move us deeper with you. Father, that we push into your word. Father, that we, we rely and we stand next to the truth no matter what happens. We stand next to you. Our purpose is in you. And Father, let us look to the horizon with a smile upon our face with anticipation because we know you're coming back triumphantly Father God and I believe it'll be soon Father let us be prepared let us be optimistic and let us know that we have done what we can do to further your kingdom Father, put your arms around us, around this church family. As we leave here today, grow us and move us because there's new things coming, exciting things coming. But it's going to take optimism and it's going to take dedication. 
to moving on your behalf. Father, we give you all the glory, the honor, and the praise. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.